This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Joe Guang Yu won this 2024 Formula One season with three years of experience under his helmet, 12 career points to date, a highest career finish of P8, and a highest qualifying position of P5. Him and Valtteri haven't had many opportunities in that Sauber to make an impression, and both of their seats are absolutely seen to be up for grabs going into this chaotic driver transfer period. But here's why I think he may well be actually, you know what, the perfect driver for the incoming Audi, why I think Joe Guan Yu may stick around till 2026 and beyond. My name's Tomo, let's talk about it. When any modern day Formula One team is evaluating a driver for one of them seats, they've got two things to consider, haven't they? On track performance, off track value. Some bring loads of talent in the car and very few marketing opportunities outside of it. Think uh, Nico Hülkenberg, Esteban Ocon, Oscar Piastri right now as well. Others, of course, do it the other way around, right? Nikita Mazepin, when Ragunathan drove the Alfa Romeo Sauber test. Mad that even happened. We as fans, of course, want the merit on track to be the number one priority, but realistically, in this day and age, you kind of do have to have a bit of both. And look, typically great performances on track will eventually build your brand off it. Again, Oscar Piastri right now, pretty low key off track. But if he starts winning races, beating your Maxes, your Charles, your Lewises, your Landos, right? If he starts doing that in any consistent way, his profile off track is going to skyrocket for sure. So for the driver in question, Joe Guan Yu, I want to start with this off track value because that is certainly the easier argument to make as to why Audi will keep him long-term why is the perfect driver for them. The Chinese market is a huge market for Audi and a bigger deal to Audi than I really realized. I mean, back in April last year, for example, Audi hosted a huge presentation at Auto Shanghai, China's premier automotive show, and Zhou Guanyu's home city, funnily enough. We got some very poignant words from Audi CEO Marcus Duisman. We are convinced that our Formula One commitment will strengthen Audi's sporting focus. The racing series is continuously increasing its global reach, especially among young target groups and in our most important sales market, China. Not one of their most important sales market. And remember, the only reason these big automotive brands go anywhere near Formula One is marketing, is to put their marquee in front of an audience that they think they can convert into buying their road cars. Only problem for Marcus is a couple of months after he made these quotes, he was sacked as CEO of Audi by the board. And according to Forbes, this was because of falling China sales and a slow EV product rollout. When failings in a specific national market, China, result in the CEO of a global brand like Audi, getting fired, you know this is a big deal to them, right? Cracking the Chinese market is a huge deal to Audi. Plus the whole slow EV product rollout thing kind of also applies to this because Audi are going all in on electric and the electric car market is way more established in China than you might think. Quoted by Audi themselves from 2026 onwards, Audi will only introduce fully electric models to the market. Audi thus intends to offer at least one electric vehicle in all core segments by 2027. A roadmap to electrification also includes the gradual phasing out of production vehicles with combustion engines by 2033. 2033, no more petrol, no more diesel, no more hybrids, all EVs. For a marquee like Audi that, we've got to be honest, that Audi's my favorite German car manufacturer. I love an Audi, an old RS4 does it for me. And it does pain me to move away from combustion as a petrol head, right? But that's just kind of the way the world's going. And you gotta keep up, otherwise you'll be left behind. Kind of like if you've got your own business, uh, but don't have a website, right? Because, yeah, I know social media is important, right? You have your nice Instagram and, and Facebook and all that stuff, Facebook. I don't think I've used Facebook in like eight years, but the beauty of having your very own online home, a website you can call your own, using today's video sponsor Squarespace, of course, to build it is that you can customize it to your heart's content, whether you want a bunch of images, whether you want copy, whether you want people to be able to submit 
their information to, I don't know, pre-book a restaurant or, I don't know, if you're interested in Tomo's Racing Goods, future drop coming, maybe look at this t-shirt, maybe this is the sample without the design on, maybe. You can do whatever you like, 24 seven customer support as well, and free to try. It's only when you wanna publish your finished website live to the world that you have to pay anything, and when that time inevitably comes around, head to squarespace.com slash TomoF1 to get 10% off your first website or domain. Okay, so why is China such a big deal to Audi? We've established that it clearly is, but but what's the reason? Well, from the obvious, the 1.4 billion population with an increasing upper middle class uh, who can afford a marquee with the prestige of Audi, because obviously Audi position themselves more towards the premium than the, the lower end, right? But on top of that, Audi is, I'm sure, very cognizant and aware to the fact that they have to work a lot harder than they probably did in the past and any foreign brand going into China. They have to work harder to get that market share because the Chinese automotive sector didn't used to get taken seriously at all, but since this EV revolution has really started, they've been on it. Gone are the days of poorly executed, blatant rip-off copies, and now they're producing their own cars from scratch, their own platforms. There's some serious names out there. Think BYD, for example. They've just broken into the top 10 automotive companies in the world in 2023 with a revenue of over $50 billion. Some of you will never have heard of them. In fact, I only heard of BYD. Only like a few months ago, I saw a review of one on, uh, on YouTube, but they're slowly growing and I can only speak for the UK market personally, right? But I'm starting to see a few on the road now. Positioning themselves as a bit of an alternative to Tesla in many ways, that BYD seal really does look like a Model 3 and a nicer Model 3 actually. I'm not a big fan of the Model 3. I think the seal looks just purely aesthetically nicer. Also, BYD are an official partner of the Euros this year. So get ready to be seeing that logo a lot more. Uh, in the in the coming months then there's mg right famous british sports car marquee kind of died in 2005 right we thought yeah another british sports car brand was doomed and gone forever however just like lotus who were bought out by geely chinese company the mg branding name and their longbridge factory was purchased by nanjing automobile a chinese state-owned company and then in 2007 another chinese state-owned company bought Nanjing SAIC, which means they got the MG brand and they remain a big part of the SAIC Auto Corp portfolio of brands to this day. In fact, they are the biggest importer of Chinese cars into the United Kingdom under the MG brand. That's why in the UK you're seeing MGs all over the place now, but they're actually Chinese cars. Oh, and also SAIC actually do have a direct link to Audi that I only came across researching this. So it was announced last year that SAIC and Audi will be partnering on an EV platform, which to my understanding essentially means that Audi for certain models will be using the SAC almost chassis, I guess, for want of a better term, with the batteries and all that, that, that platform. And then you kind of plonk your own body on top. That's serious, that's a serious connection. So again, how do Audi establish their marquee in a Chinese market that's increasingly full of competition and competition that a lot of it is state owned? So priority is gonna be ultimately given, be that through the Chinese purchaser being like, well, I'd rather buy from a Chinese brand, or obviously the Chinese state, giving certain tax breaks and all that to these companies to operate in China to try and get their own cars bought by their own population. Well, if Audi align with high profile marketing opportunities like Formula One and high profile marketing individuals like Zhou Guan Yu, that's surely the way forward for them. Zhou Guan Yu is not only the only Chinese driver on the grid, he is also the first full-time Chinese Formula One driver ever. In fact, he's literally got a little mini doc that was announced like today, as I'm recording this, uh, called the first one that is uh, only been shown in China, which is a bit of a shame, but hopefully we get a, a dubbed English version at some point, because it'd be quite interesting. And even the fact that Drive to Survive isn't officially broadcast in China, according to Joe himself, that hasn't stopped the popularity of the sport really starting to jump over there. Speaking to Sky Sports last year regarding the next Chinese Grand Prix, I have no doubts all the tickets will be sold out really quick and that it will be packed with people around the whole circuit. I felt the popularity improve growing up in recent years, especially the last few years since I became an F1 driver. Yes, the Shanghai International Circuit will finally be back on the calendar 
within a month now. It's not long to wait. A track we haven't raced at since 2019. A super underrated track as well. It's got a great identity in that first corner, hasn't it? With that long, long, long right-hander into the left-hander. Plenty of overtaking opportunities as well well it's a it's a hidden gem i'd say but again we've never raced there in the ground effect here right? and we've never raced there since the the effect of drive to survive has really kicked in right yes drive to survive did exist in 2019 but it was lockdown drive to survive that really kind of skyrocketed it i think joe's right i think the stands will be packed and i think he'll be getting absolutely mobbed i mean you look at what max verstappen did for the dutch audience right gave them a driver to really get behind and the fact that he was really fighting at the top as well that's obviously a big thing that that joe doesn't have but i do think joe can have a similar impact on the chinese audience really give them someone to to cultivate and get behind and the fact we've not had a chinese grand prix since he's been on the grid i think once this 2024 chinese grand prix is broadcast across the country i think that's gonna convert so many more people to be aware of of joe guang yu in his home country. I mean, he's not even done his home race yet and he's already a massive market and brand deal in China. I mean, just look at all of the, the stuff he's done already. Wall Street Journal photo shoots, Asus ROG Ambassador, Zika Electric Cars Ambassador, El Men's photo shoots, Esquire photo shoots, Lululemon Ambassador, Dior photo shoots. The list goes on and on and on. He loves his clobber. He's always bringing the fire fits in the paddock. Giving Lewis a run for his money some weekends for sure. Like, it's all part of it. He might only have a million followers on Instagram, but on Weibo, he's got over two and a half million, which is where it really matters in the domestic Chinese market. I'll be really interested to see how his numbers change after the Chinese Grand Prix, especially on, again, Chinese platforms like Weibo. I think they're gonna, they're gonna skyrocket. Look, all this off-track value that he brings would be valuable to any team on the grid in some way. However, I mean, look, what? Williams, they've got, you know, the real and back to American money. Red Bull are an energy drink company. Then, obviously, Ferrari have got Leclerc, Hamilton, Bim, and they're sorted for, for drivers. You know, Mercedes have got Russell and probably Antonelli, maybe Alonso Science, who knows? Gene Haas lacks the cash, but he just wants to shift more CNC machines. I don't know if Joe Guan Yu sitting next to a CNC machine quite hits the same as him being on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. It's just my opinion. McLaren probably do get good money in terms of car orders from China, and having Joe in their car would certainly help push more uh, orders in China, but come on, they've got Lando and, and Oscar, and that's a huge, especially Lando, obviously value off track for Lando, but value on track, them two are just killing it. Aston Martin is a pretty compelling case, to be fair, for Joe. Look at Aston Martin's share price that they could do with shifting some cars, and what well, I actually asked you lot, who would, you know, who do you think is more talented, Joe or Stroll? And people just about think Stroll. So if you wanted, you know, to move Lance over to, to WEC, to the Valkyrie project, Lawrence, keep him in Aston Martin, put Joe in there as kind of second driver to replace Lance, a little bit of a like for like change, you could argue. Big market and opportunity to shift some Aston Martins in China. Alpine could actually be a maybe as well. Not only did Joe used to be part of the Renault Academy, but again, talking about off-track stuff, Alpine, there's been reports that uh, Geely, who own Lotus, are actually investing a bit of money in Alpine and, and kind of working together there. So maybe Joe finds a way in there. But I still think out of Aston Alpine and Audi, the A's, I think Audi's the one that, off track, it ticks all the boxes off track, pretty much all of them. But now's the part where you've got to justify why he should be in that car for on track reasons, and I think I can. Do I think Joe is a number one driver, a driver that a team like Audi can really cultivate and build around going forward, kind of like James Vowles has said a lot about Alex Albon at Williams. No, I don't believe that. I don't think Joe has shown enough to, to prove that he's ready to take on that responsibility. He is still only 24, okay? So I think he's got room to grow, no doubt. However, number ones are kind of overrated. I mean, you need a number one. Two number ones, they're overrated. A one and a two is kind of what you want to keep things chill, to keep internal politics level, right? You want one driver that's got that extra few tenths in qualifying and that extra couple of tenths in race pace. Like imagine if right now Mercedes, Ferrari and McLaren 
all were delivering packages to their drivers that they could fight with Max for wins. George and Lewis would be constantly tripping over each other. Charles and Carlos, I think it would eventually come to blows. Like We'd see a bit more antics like Monza last year, right? Even Lando and Oscar. Oscar's getting there. It's a challenge now for McLaren to try and manage them too. But then if you add Aston Martin to that conversation, right, and give them a competitive package, well, we know only Fernando Alonso is going to be the one getting the maximum out of that. I'm not going to have to worry about tripping over Stroll because he's plenty clear of Lance Stroll. It's just the truth. When you've got a Hamilton Bottas, a Schumacher Barrichello, a Verstappen Perez even, right? Perez has tried to fight it, but Max is putting him in his place. It's easier to manage and it's easier to, to cultivate a driver's championship push. So the driver that obviously has been linked with Audi the most going forward is Carlos Sainz. And the Carlos sainz Joe new pairing seems pretty appealing to me. It's a clear one too. I think Carlos Sainz has shown that, yes, he's not quite got the out and out pace of Charles Leclerc, but he is an incredibly well-rounded driver. With Joe Guanyu being that kind of clear number two who can still be there. I mean, you look at his pace relative to Bottas in qualifying for Joe. It's been pretty close over their tenure together. He could really galvanize behind Sainz, but I still think Joe would do a really good number two job. Maybe this full Audi buyout now, the fact that they're taking on all the shares, not just 75, will give Carlos a bit more confidence in that project long term. Maybe that's what he needs to be prepared to take on that one season of it still being Sauber in 2025 before then it becomes Audi in 26. But then also maybe a Hulk and Joe pairing. Okay, we know that Sauber are interested, Seidel is interested in Hulkenberg and Haas chose to take up their option for a one-year extension on his contract. Hulk still showing he's got that one lap pace for sure. But I mean, we've seen him and Joe battling this last kind of, you know, well, last season anyway. On occasion, I think Joe's held his own. Yes, Nico does have that qualifying advantage. He was also quite a bit older than well, way older than Joe and, and a good chunk older than Science. So I still think Science would be a more appealing prospect to Audi. But Hulkenberg, of course, a German driver, driving for a German marquee. That one also makes a lot of sense. He'd probably be cheaper than Carlos as well. Definitely be cheaper than Carlos. And look, Science and Hulkenberg, I don't think they have the off-track brand audience power. Neither of them have what Joe Guanyu has. I mean, certainly not Nico Hulkenberg. He definitely doesn't. He's very very low key. He doesn't bring a lot of brand support with him. Of course, Carlos Sainz, you know, he's got his Australia uh, connection, but Alonso's still got a stranglehold on that Spanish audience. He's still the Spanish driver that most Spanish fans will galvanize and, and, and put their support towards. I'm here on the Western side, right, looking at Carlos Sainz and seeing the support he gets, but I just think we're massively underrating the support Joe is getting and he's going to get after this Chinese Grand Prix. Bringing in Joe is a pretty reliable number two ignoring last week at Saudi, I guess, where he shunted it in FP3. That wasn't very Joe-like. He, he's been pretty clean. But also you look at how he's done relative to Valtteri Bias, who's 10 years older than him, way more experienced. You can't tell me that Joe doesn't have the potential to be as good as Bottas was at his best. A lot of this is down to how much you think Valtteri's performances have waned. I mean, look, Kimi Raikkonen in his later years at that team alongside Joe Venazzi, I don't think that was the Kimi we saw in 2003, four that kind of prime Kimi era, absolutely no way, right? But if you think Kimi was still at those levels, then Giovinazzi did an incredible job. Yes, if you take the names away, if you take the ages away, you look at driver one and two, over the two and a bit years together, who's impressed more? Bottas. Yes, I agree. The start of 2022 was really strong. Joe was still getting on top of that car, still got a P10 on debut, but Bottas was the stronger driver in 22. And last year, I mean, he outscored Joe. I would say outperformed him just. There's not much in it. You look at the qualifying gap between the two of them over those two seasons, the, the average pace difference, and it's really not enough to be like, right, it's worth taking a driver who's 10 years older and doesn't have anywhere near the marketing clout of Joe Guan Yu. I just don't understand, looking at what we've seen, even agreeing that Bottas has been slightly better. Why you would choose Bottas over Joe if you're Audi. And also, I'm not being funny, right? If you ask me what I want, do I want Joe and Bottas in those seats? I think there's other drivers who deserve an opportunity more than both of them. I think Porsche, 
has done more to merit that seat over Joe. And I think, you know, you look at Lawson, you look at how many drivers want to get into F1 and can't. I mean, Drogovic won F2, even someone like Alex Pelot, we know he wants to get into F1. I think he massively deserves a seat. But this isn't about what I want. This is about me looking at, at Audi, looking at their moves, what they're up to. A lot of people, and myself in my pre-season predictions, I predicted Joe won't be in the seat in 2025, but I've gone back on that. It would really help Joe for him to beat Bottas this year, of course, but also that car's not given either of them much to play with. But Hulkenberg and Albon have shown that even if you're in a pretty bad car, you can still show your, your ability. And I, I would like to see Joe to step up and this not just be a marketing decision. Because I think he can offer both. Let me know what you think. His Bahrain P11 was pretty good. But then his pit stop in Saudi was terrible. But then Bottas had a terrible pit stop in Bahrain. So again, Sauber, sort it out. Give your drivers a chance to sign. Because Joe and Bottas have to fight two for now this year. To guarantee themselves a seat in any team. Let alone Audi. But I think Joe's... I think Joe's got the better chance of sticking around. Don't they? Like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new and you want to see more. My name's Tomo. Thanks again. Have a good one.